Coming up on Digital Music Trends 195, recorded on the 6th of August 2014, we chat about Beats Music and iTunes Radio, Milk Music and its premium tier, Shazam's Mac app and Resonate product, Rhapsody's mini acquisition spree, Apple acquiring Swell, and finally my guests chat about their latest projects, which are PowerToThePeople.fm and the Witch Platform report on Direct2Fan options. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and if you're watching the show remember that there is an audio version as well uh, for the times when you're unable to tune in uh, with your full attention and uh, likewise if you're on the audio version and you would like to see our lovely faces once in a while you can go and check out the video version and if you'd like to receive a, a weekly newsletter uh, that lets you know when the shows are out and uh, essentially the latest on the podcast uh, once a week week and you can sign up on bit.ly slash dmt list and this week it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, jesse scholar from wix did works a london-based agency specializing in directive and marketing and retail strategies so hi jesse and thanks for joining us how's it going it's going well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you, and we're going to talk about, uh, more about Wixteed uh, later on, but it's uh, great to have you back on the show. And also, I'm really happy to welcome back uh, Sid Lawrence, co-founder of uh, We Make Awesome Shit. So hi, Sid, and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Yeah, good, thank you. Again, yeah, thank you for having me on, on the show. It's great to have you. And uh, this is another relatively quiet uh, news week. Uh, well, relatively, I, I would say. There's actually a few things that have come up in the last uh, couple of days. Uh, but uh, whether you're listening, uh, you know, at the beach or uh, in, in the office, uh, uh, prepare for an August extravaganza of uh, uh, different things. And hopefully it's going to be fun. Uh, so, uh, you know, I want to start this week by talking about Beats. Uh, we've heard that the company uh, migrated all of its workforce to Apple. Uh, but that around 200 people will not be sticking around uh, for the long term as they will be reassigned within Apple or uh, will be let go because uh, they were uh, performing overlapping functions uh, essentially as to, uh, as to they were already being uh, uh, fulfilled at Apple itself. Uh, uh, this makes sense of course you know uh, finance and HR I'm sure Apple is pretty uh, solid on and so it would be difficult to find a place for some of those people uh, but uh, aside from that uh, uh, we've also learned uh, from reports that Ian Rogers uh, will remain as the head of Beats Music but will also become the head of iTunes Radio reporting to their Directly to Apple's IDQ. So Rogers uh, moved to Beats in late 2012 after spending several years at the helm of uh, Directive Fan platform Topspin. And uh, iTunes Radio, of course, is a centerpiece of uh, the iOS music offering uh, since a, a year, year and a half. Uh, but it isn't very sexy as a product. And uh, although it does have quite a bit of users, uh, it, it could do with a bit of a shine that rubs off from Beats music. Also, I was also wondering whether uh, the appointment of, of, of Ian to, to both uh, projects could also reveal something about Apple's strategy in the really tricky migration process from downloads to streams and whether the integration be, uh, some sort of integration between Beats Music and the iTunes radio project could uh, sort of f find a path towards um, directing some users that are really into it towards streaming without really uh, alienating the majority of users that are still uh, hooked on downloads so uh, what do you f how do you feel about this uh, do you think there are synergies between iTunes radio and Beats uh, Sid? Um, yeah definitely um, I mean, well, the, the the biggest annoyance for me is that they're both still American based, right? It's right. still US only. Yeah. Um, so iTunes Radio, uh, from I, I have a UK point of view, and yeah. iTunes Radio, obviously, I don't really know anyone that uses it. But if you look at the numbers, I mean, it's huge, right? The In the States, there's a lot of people using iTunes Radio. Um, and again, Beats is US only. So I was kind of. Uh, I'm, I've been waiting until they launch it outside of the US, either one of those platforms. Yeah. Um, but there's there's definitely a lot of uh, similarities between the two, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, uh, it's just uh, uh, interesting to see also how uh, Ian has migrated it to, to this position. So, so J Jesse, from your point of view, of course, uh, you, you worked with uh, Topspin for, for a long time. H how do you see him uh, dealing with the situation and uh, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, trying to to join two initiatives that are supposedly so so different. Yeah, that's a good question. I worked with Ian at Topspin, and he's a fantastic leader. Um, I think you know it's a it's a brilliant choice um, of personnel to to 
bring those two brands together. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess, as Sid said, these are not uh, at services that we can access here in the UK, so I'm not really all that familiar with um, iTunes Radio. Yeah. Uh, I've got a, an idea of what Beats Music is offering, but I've, I've not actually used it. Um, from what I understand, though, Beats Music doesn't have the, the free level of offering, so I guess there's a possibility that iTunes Radio could slot in yeah. if they wanted to be that tier. Um, and come together in some way. At the same time, both of these brands are very strong brands, and it's it's hard to kind of picture how it will work to create a single brand if that's in ca- indeed what what's on the cards. I don't know. Yeah, no, absolutely. But at the same time, if that is what's on the cards, then hey, Ian yeah. Rogers will be the man to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it kind of feels like a. It, it would it would be easy for them to add something along the lines of you know a pop up that if you use iTunes Radio a lot tells you oh if you really like streaming you should go and check out Beat Music and then start sort of that process of migration of users from one platform to the other. Uh, but again, it would feel a f- like a fairly disjointed experience if they keep both things yeah. completely separate. So yeah, it's going to be very uh, it's going to be a headache I think for them. It's going to take a few months for them to figure out what, what what's what's going to happen with that. I mean, I don't think I, I don't think they're going to keep them as two separate entities, right? I mean, iTunes Radio is the from what I gather, it's similar to Pandora in the way that it operates, yeah. or Spotify Artist Radio, or one of the other many uh, radio services. And then you've got Beats, which is not only the streaming platform, um, but it also has that whole um, human gen- uh, curated playlist. Yeah. So I think it. it I can't see that in in six months to a year's time if they're still operating as two separate brands, then. Um, I'm going to be massively surprised. Yeah. No, no, you're right. And I, I mean, I guess the, the, the big problem there is, is the fact that, uh, uh, as you said, Sid, uh, both services are US only for now. And uh, if Apple bought Beats in order to you know, streamline its uh, shift towards streaming, uh, it's got a, still got a p- massive hurdle to overcome in, in terms of uh, actually getting those international licenses and managing to... Uh, to uh, internationalize the service properly, so th- we're gonna we're gonna it's gonna be interesting to see how much money they're willing to throw at labels in order to get the licenses as fast as possible, essentially. Uh, and th- another beats uh, point, I guess, is that oh, um, another thing was that I noticed that uh, Dave Allen, who has been on the show a couple of times, actually just changed his uh, his uh, role to labor relations at Apple on LinkedIn. So congrats to Dave, and uh, uh, great to see him migrate to Apple, and he's gonna do great things there, I'm sure. And, and sticking with beats, actually, Universal Music's uh, parent company Vivendi issued a press release on Friday which confirmed the sale of 13% of, of its 13% stake in Beats uh, uh, to Apple uh, for $404 million so a, a pretty decent uh, uh, payday for Universal uh, and Vivendi there and uh, the major of course had close ties uh, uh, with Beats since uh, uh, Jimmy Iovine uh, was chairman and CEO of Interscope, Geffen and A&M uh, and also chairman of Beats Electronics uh, and uh, I tried to sort of uh, figure out where that 13% share came from because uh, uh, according to Vivendi's 2011 financial report, the company had actually sold 21% uh, of its share in the a uh, 21% share in Beats uh, to HTC uh, for 89 million euros, and uh, I couldn't really figure out whether they'd sold all of their share or whether they had some left, and that's where the 13% comes from, because I couldn't find any subsequent uh, indication that they'd invested again in Beats when uh, when the company uh, pur- uh, purchased its shares back from HT- HTC between 2012 and 2013. So yeah, a, a bit of a, a bit of a question mark there. Uh, and uh, another thing I wanted to point out is the fact that some I, I read a few blogs talking about the fact that none of the money is going to go to uh, artists in this case but in this case it's one of the probably the, the only case where I don't think that it should in the sense that it feels like this was uh, an investment in the in the company and that's why they got the percentage there was no catalog in question that you know they didn't have the clout on catalog front to get that, that percentage from beats and it was either a personnel uh, you know question of you know them giving uh, uh, Jimmy Ivy the permission to, to do this as well or uh, some money might have changed hands but either way it doesn't feel like it was tied to the catalog so I don't know Jesse do you feel like uh, there is a question mark there uh, on on whether any of this money should go back to artists or uh, is it just you know I, I feel like it's just an investment yeah I mean that, that's really what it comes what it seems to come down to the, yeah. the point being whether uh, techni- technically whether the consideration for Universal's investment was cash or whether it was somehow reflecting some sort of license arrangement. And that doesn't seem to be clear, to be honest. I mean, I haven't looked extensively into this, but the stuff that I've read, that seems to be the question. And if it is some kind of licensing arrangement, then it just seems to be yet another 
this instance um, which we saw with um, with YouTube's premium platform and the negotiations and around Spotify that potentially. Well, yeah. Yeah, potentially relevant also for any kind of SoundCloud equity deal that might be on the cards. And that, that's all super relevant for um, the arguments that, that brought about the World Independent Network's Fair Digital Deal Declaration, which I'm, I'm sure has been discussed at length. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I am in a statement as well. So I think, you know, I think this is this kind of stuff keeps coming up and it just, I guess it's kind of obvious that there needs to be some sort of transparency and understanding yeah. um, so that people can have business transactions and it not kick off a big fuss. Everyone just goes, right, okay, it's this or it's that. And if it's this, then this is how we deal with it. Yeah, exactly. And in I a mean, perfect world, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, I, I couldn't I couldn't really figure out clearly where that uh, percentage share came from. And that's probably... Uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that should be clear because then it would make the conversation yeah. a lot easier. If you knew that Universal had invested X amount and that had generated that percentage and then the sale would be essentially like buying a house or buying an office block and seeing that mm. property value go up and then you can reap the, the benefits of the investment. But uh, it, it's just not really clear where the percentage came from. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see yeah, what I mean, this is it. a This is a, a huge major label with vast catalogs. It just... I'm supposing that there's some reflection of that catalog in the arrangement and that's you know complete supposition but yeah i mean it's just because you know beats is just an electronics company so uh, you know of course beats music may have come into the picture but i i feel like that sure. came to too late into the picture to affect the percentage ownership uh, that they would have in beats uh, as a whole and so th that was the reason why i thought you know maybe the catalog didn't have anything to do with it it was just yeah a, no that's a good point yeah, a monetary arrangement. But I don't know, Sid, how, how do you feel about these uh, sort of murky waters of uh, uh, ownership stakes from major labels in, in, in third party companies? Uh, it all depends what was in the contract. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, we, we've got no idea. I mean, we can speculate all we like, and we know certainly past experiences. And Oh, yeah, for fun. sure. <laughs> oh, but, but contracts are always murky. Yeah. I mean, like, We've had a, a legal issue recently um, that I'm not going to go into too much detail, sure, except that someone uh, asked us to come up with a proposal and design for a site, told us that our creativity wasn't good enough, and then went and got someone else to build exactly the same thing. Um, and uh, so, and that we didn't have, that's changed our whole attitude. We've kind of, we've been playing it very uh, loose, I guess. Yeah. with regards to we haven't had an issue before um we've had contracts for bigger projects now mu our music projects as we all know there's not exactly a huge amount of money in music so our music projects certainly aren't our bigger projects and so as soon as we want to try and get anyone to to for the projects that we do from a music point of view they're often like two week turnarounds yeah now, if we try and then hold that up with negotiations on a contract for a project that's going to cost, that's going to make us less money than that's going to spend in legal time, yeah. then um, it changes the whole ballgame. So, uh, yeah, I have suddenly, within the last few days, changed my opinion on contracts. Um, <laughs> just... And don't, yeah, I mean, it all depends what's in that contract. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, uh, it's, Definitely. So, I mean, it, it, it's just a question of transparency at this point. I mean, whether anybody will, will question it or not, or whether we're trying to get some more information on this, I'm not sure. But it would be great to, to know more about the, the background of, of these deals if uh, if the companies are likely to disclose that. And uh, uh, moving on from uh, uh, talking about Beats to talking about uh, Samsung. So I wanted to talk about Milk Music because uh, uh, we talked about this uh, quite a bit on the show and we covered the rumors of a pre premium tier uh, previously. But the company has now actually officially launched a premium tier for Milk music which is an internet radio service that is us only again and was introduced by samsung at south by southwest 2014 and uh, uh, the premium service actually is going to be different from the usual uh, you know pandora like uh, services because both the free and the premium version uh, and the premium version of milk music will remain uh, free from advertising you know essentially the company is uh, hoping that people will upgrade based on uh, uh, other functions like being able to skip as many tracks as they like uh, uh, play music without a network connection um, 
and to cache uh, radio stations on their uh, mobile devices, uh, you know, pause automatically with a sleep timer and turn DJ sta uh, turn station DJs on or off. So uh, a, f a few different features that here uh, Samsung hopes will uh, differentiate Milk Music from other services. The interesting thing is that uh, Milk Music is only available for, for Galaxy customers at the moment, so it considerably restricts uh, the pool of uh, customers uh, uh, available. In addition, it's built on top of Slacker Radio. It's essentially a, a white labeled version with a different interface and it's got a very cool uh, slick dial interface. But apart from that, it, it's actually, by all intent and purposes, very similar to the Slacker Radio Plus service, which is also for bucks a month and also offers no advertising, unlimited song skips, uh, caching uh, opportunities and all, all sorts of stuff uh, uh, like that. And uh, uh, so I guess, you know, my question is, you know, we've, we've had... We've covered Milk before, and I know that we've been fairly negative around the service uh, for uh, for uh, in the last few episodes. So I wanted to uh, take a different angle in this week and, and ask you, uh, how do you think a service like this could work? Is there anything good that I listed that you, you, you think might drive consumers into using it? And if not, what do you think could Samsung do to, to change it for the better rather than focusing on why it wouldn't work? Uh, Jesse, anything on that? Um, yeah. You know what? I don't have a Samsung phone, no, yeah. um, yeah, much less a Galaxy phone. So, yeah, let's talk about this hypothetically. Um, I think that <laughs> yeah, kind of absolutely. wiping it out, we have um, – it's definitely a growing trend in, in this service, this service level at this price point, right? I mean, there's quite a few at this price point now where you get um, a step down from the on-demand streaming services. You have a streaming radio. It's quite a lot cheaper. Um, I think that the features sound really good, actually. And I think that if I had a Samsung Galaxy phone, I'd probably use it. Yeah. Especially with, um, you know, if it's not going to be using my data plan, if I've got a massive capacity so I can um, cache lots of stuff on there and it's not going to impact my, my usage, then um, great. Why not? Do yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. What about the catalog, though? Do we know much about the catalog? Uh, the catalog is based on Slacker's catalog, so right. I think okay. it's pretty so, extensive. Uh, yeah. It's just a question, of course, that you, you can, I think, create stations, but you can't choose what tracks are going to be played because, of course, it's not an on-demand service. So It sounds uh, great. Yeah, I guess that's that's the, the, the main drawback of it. Uh, uh, Sid, do you think that people are willing to... to uh, you know, we talked about this middle tier a lot, and, uh, you know, is this $4 or, you know, an equivalent of £2.50 uh, something of a sweet spot uh, for, for consumers, and, and can it drive more more customers to streaming? Well, I mean, as Jesse said, if I, I haven't got a... Oh, I do. I have a test Galaxy phone for testing, and right. I don't really use it. Um, it's... I, I, I'm wondering why Samsung are doing it. So the, the obvious answer would be to try and encourage people to get a Galaxy phone so that they have this access to this music service. But ultimately, it's not, it's not a, a deal that is going to drive people to do that. Right. So it just seems to be their direct competitor to iTunes Radio. But then iTunes Radio... Is iTunes Radio paid for? I presume Apple no, covers the cost yeah, of it. Because yeah. it's Apple's trying to get people to use uh, you Apple devices. You get it ad-free if you right. pay for the iTunes match, which is 25 bucks a month. Uh, uh, sorry, right. a, year. a year. A year. Yeah. So are Samsung doing it to try and encourage people to get their devices? If so, they haven't done a good enough job. Um, it's not going to encourage, uh, well, it's not going to encourage either I or Jesse to get a Samsung device. Yeah. Um, are they doing it because it's going to make them money? I, well, I don't think any of us will agree that that's going to be the case. Yeah. Um, so why are they doing it? They've tried a lot of music services in the past, Samsung have, and they've never really done that well. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess it's like... Closed their, Sorry, go ahead. Go well, they closed their music store recently. Yeah. Um, I mean, we did a project with them about a year ago, which was using their music store. And uh, entertainingly, I think the music store shut down about a week after they wanted to run this campaign. Um, and uh, so it's kind of, why are they doing it? Is it good for the users? Yeah, if I had a Galaxy phone and I was in America um, and I wasn't paying for another uh, streaming service and I didn't want to use a free streaming, a free radio service, um, then yes. But I think I've just covered all other possibilities. Um, 
I guess like what well, my my stance was that uh, following on from what you were saying about why would people like uh, people wouldn't buy the Galaxy phone because of this feature. But the other thing that I was wondering is that Samsung may be trying to create a a walled garden in an ecosystem where there are no walled gardens in the sense that uh, on Android you can switch from make to make without really f feeling any pinch or any difference. Uh, or oh, you can't know. really. Not can't quite. Really? Okay, that's, cool. No, that's the, that's the, that's the mis misbelief, I guess. Because I don't have an Android um, phone, so I'm, I'm just talking crap, really. So Samsung have their own app store, right? <laughs> right. Um, there's the Google Play Store, which is kind of the all-encompassing, but then that's actually, there's the Samsung one itself, then there's the, obviously Amazon have their own one. Yeah. And if you transfer, if you buy one on one store, you can't then just download it from another store for free. Yeah. So there is still this walled garden esque thing. And maybe that is what Samsung are doing. I mean, they're, they've, they've been working on their platform called Tizen for quite a while, which is their operating system. Um, but we're, I think we're seeing phones come out on, from them uh, in the next six months or so. There's, there's been a couple of test devices out, et cetera, but nothing in the, in the real public. Right. Um, but so maybe they're just trying to make sure they have a music service for their new platform rather than it being, I don't know. No, it's I mean, a funny thing. I think it's, it's them. It's Samsung. Thing, yeah. I mean, Samsung, remember, do everything, right? I mean, they, they yeah. do everything from fridges to <laughs> phones to cameras to anything that they can do, um, they will do. And maybe it's just because their last music service failed that they might as well try another one. Yeah. Um, um, it's it makes sense like you know i was talking about wall gardens just because i was thinking maybe it's a way for them to make people feel like if they leave samsung they won't be able to have milk music again and if they got used to it then there might be a reason for them to stick with the same brand but it's a very it's a fairly weak reason to stick with the same brand uh, yeah but yeah uh, especially it, when you're paying them more money for it <laughs> exactly i mean if it was free then yeah that would be well i don't i, I don't want to get a different device i'm getting all my music for free yeah which samsung are paying for but I don't know. Interesting stuff. But uh, I want to go back to uh, uh, what we were talking about last week, actually, talking about independent musicians. And, and Jesse wanted to ask you about uh, what have you been up to recently of, with the Wixteed? And uh, uh, you've, got, you've got an interesting project that's uh, actually, you got the first uh, glimpses of it on, on your website right now on wixteedworks.com. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, just tell us what, what we've been up to in the last few months. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the main piece of work that I've been um, busy with at Wixteed is um, da, 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 this document. All right. <laughs> which you might be able to see, but nice. you can't see it. I'll tell you what it says. Sure. It's, uh, it's our director fan witch platform report. And essentially, this is a very in depth study which looks at uh, 10 leading director fan platforms and um, compares them across a whole range of different features. Uh, as a newcomer to the market, it can be difficult to differentiate which service you want to use. If you want to build a store with Bandcamp, if you want to build a store with, I don't know, Topspin, Music Glue. Um, there's, there's so many players in this market now. Um, and there keeps being more and more. I keep hearing about more and more. So this is basically the first edition. Um, of what I imagine will be many updates. Um, but we've awesome. essentially broken it down into about 40 different criteria, and we've gone into a pretty deep dive into each platform to really get to the nuts and bolts of what you're getting when yeah. you sign up to use that service. That's fantastic, and it's... Uh, nice. It's uh, well overdue because uh, I know a lot of people that are, uh, keep asking me about which service they should use, and it's right. you know because I don't I don't work in that space uh, directly. It's, it's really hard to advise people. I can Send tell them, them the to names. Me. Yes, exactly. It's perfect. <laughs> and uh, and also on the website you can sign up uh, on it is wixedworks.com, right? I didn't I didn't mess up your website. Sure. No, it's uh, perfect. perfect. Uh, if you go there uh, on the last tab, uh, it, there is actually a place you can sign up uh, with your email, and you might mm -hmm. receive a little glimpse of the report and some more details as to how. Yeah. Get you'll get a free it. you'll get a free sample document perfect awesome that's fantastic and uh, uh, definitely after last week's uh, discussion around Bandcamp uh, mm -hmm. uh, it'd be great to get uh, a bit more of a, a birds uh, a birds view of uh, what's happening in the rest of the space because uh, the the musicians we had last week were really uh, uh, excited about Bandcamp I, <laughs> yeah. I feel like we overshadowed everybody else <laughs> Bandcamp's a great platform it is yeah. a good one and uh, uh, Sid, uh, so let's, let's talk about you. Uh, you had something uh, really exciting launch today, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, what's that uh, all about? Well, yeah, so I've been spending the last few months working um, with Basement Jacks on a project for them, um, which is a creative outlet for the world to try and to kind of collaborate. Um, awesome. It's called Power to the People FM. 
uh, powerofthepeople.fm. Um, and it's, well, so this, yes, I'm just trying to think of timings uh, of when best to say that it went live. Uh, so as we're recording this, the domain name is currently propagating, which yes. means that it's live for some people and not for others. Yeah. Uh, you're currently watching this uh, the day after yes. that we're recording this. Yeah. So it should be live now for you. So Perfect. go to powertopeople.fm. Um, basically from there, they're doing, they want to launch um, a charity song for World Peace Day. Yeah. Um, and it will be using people from all around the world to create this one song. Um, so they've created a song, but they're getting other people to do their own versions, their own mixes, etc. You can actually go online and you can use other people's elements of the song to create your own mix. Nice. Um, and you can uh, explore all of the mixes, all of the songs, and all of the elements. Um, and it's it's quite fun. We've got there's already quite a few people have contributed towards yeah. it. Um, my favourite at the moment is Mylin Class. She's doing her harp in a field, as uh, as you would imagine Mylin Class playing her harp. Um, and there's there's loads more coming uh, and up there at the moment. Uh, Rob, who's actually our designer, he's been drumming away with his brother to create his own version of the song. Um, cool. And there's uh, in Paraguay, there's a band that are playing uh, recycled instruments, um, and they're literally instruments made out of like cans and stuff. Not just like broken instruments that they then fix. They've created their own instruments um, using things that they've found in the bin. Um, it's incredible. It's amazing. Like the just some of the the creativity coming from the people is ace. Um, awesome. And so yeah, so this has just gone live, um, and uh, hopefully it will do well. Hopefully people will enjoy it. As I said, it's for a charity song. Um, it's much more. Uh, a fun piece and a, a creative collaborative piece yeah. um, rather than any kind of standard marketing-esque thing uh, that we normally do. And it's been nice to actually work direct with the artist. Ooh, um, I, I love the design of the elements, uh, the make and mix page. It's lovely. It's cool, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's very cool. <laughs> um, yeah, powerspeople.fm. Um, hopefully you like it. If you spot any issues, let me know. Um, <laughs> nothing's ever perfect. Nothing's ever bug free. Uh, I don't think we've tested it quite thoroughly. Um, but cause there's so much going on. Um, yes, there's a lot of stuff happening there. I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm, I am a little scared. Yeah. Um, no, that people are going to find things wrong with it. It seems pretty fluid, fluid. And, uh, once again, it's power to the people.fm and you also, you can check out, we, we make awesome dot it, uh, for, uh, a SID company as well. And we can continue a uh, soldier on, and uh, this, uh, uh, light news show that actually is becoming fairly crowded now. Um, I'm realizing now, but, uh, it's fine. Now uh, there's a couple of news about Shazam that I wanted to talk about. So, uh, finally a company that actually we, we, we've used and we sort of know something about <laughs> as opposed to US services. And uh, uh, first of all, the company has launched a version of its music recognition software for on the Mac App Store. So, this is free. You can choose uh, uh, for it to launch at the start every time you boot up your Mac. And then from then, it keeps on listening until it finds a, a song that it can match to the Shazam database. And then it pops up and says, oh, you're playing this song. Yes, thank you very much. And this could be construed as a little creepy or very cool, uh, depending on the points of view uh, and uh, I've seen very different uh, uh, sort of takes on this on Twitter and uh, I tried it out and it recognized uh, an Eminem song right away but it didn't recognize a, a pretty famous jazz piano release so it's kind of got the usual hits and misses on that front uh, how do you feel about it uh, uh, you know uh, Jesse do you, do, you, do you see yourself using this uh, for some reason could it be handy if you listen to the radio for example or anything like that I like Shazam. I think it's amazing service and it's really grown incredibly. Yeah. Um, that said, I don't really use it that often because I forget that it's there. Yeah. So in that in that way, if I had it, and it, it, I don't usually have apps open at startup because it leads to breakdowns, but yeah. um, if I was to have it on in the background, then maybe, you know, I would I would use it. That, that said, I don't always have my computer with me when I'm listening to music. Yeah. Um, I guess what it makes me wonder is what have they got planned? What have they got? up their sleeves because this seems like they're staging themselves for something else and i'm pretty you know i'm pretty interested to see what that is that's a very good point sid so uh i see the creepy side of things um at the same time i have it installed and it's currently running yeah um <laughs> and uh it's not well it's running in the other room but yeah, yeah. it's currently running it's not and it's kind of uh yeah exactly 
Um, if so, the last FM um, audio scrubbler, like if the audio scrubbler could have done this, then it would have been amazing for it. Right. I mean, I'm, I still scrubble to last FM. Yeah, like it, it's a case of we we have this issue with if you create a music player, you have to you either have to create well you have to add a scrubbling function to allow users to do it. So that's like an extra step from a developer point of view. But if we have something that just does it all the time anyway, then you don't need that. And so you can, I can, as a user, can listen to any uh, music on any platform, system, or whatever I want to use, and I still have my scrubbles. Yeah. Except they're now my Shazams. Um, and so I like it, and I like keeping a record of what music I listen to. Um, yeah. Even even the, the music that I don't want to admit that I listen to. <laughs> but... Um, so I think there's, I agree with Jesse with regards to it's interesting to see what they're going to do with it because they, they, I mean, that's, it's constantly running. And so it constantly pops up to say that I'm listening to a certain song. You can turn off the notifications. Yeah. Um, but so are they going to be, are they, are these the guys who are trying to create last FM 2.0 with regards to having some form of mass, um, decent suggestions? Um, yeah. and, things like that is that what they're, they're going to be trying to do um because well as we all know last fm has was the granddaddy of the music tech world um and uh, unfortunately is on its last legs and has been for quite a while yeah um so it'll be really interesting to see what they are going to be doing with this i mean they've i've, I've got ios 8 on my iphone and they've got that now built into siri as well yeah so rather than having to load up the app i can just hold down siri they put it up to my speaker, and then it uses Shazam to do the uh, the recognition. So they're they're definitely doing a they're they're an ace service. Um, sure, one day that data might get sold to somebody else, or the company might get sold to somebody else, and yeah. then they've got X number of hours of uh, of recordings. Um, who knows? Who knows who what knows they, what they can, have? Yeah, what exactly. they have. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, people could see the creepy side of things. I'm sure it's kind of like the Xbox One yeah. with the Xbox Connect being always on. So in the corner of your room, if you have an Xbox One, there's something that's just sat there listening to everything that's happening in the room uh, and watching everything that's happening in the room, not just listening to it. That's really um, weird. Oh, it is really weird. Uh, I don't have one myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I've been tempted to get one, and I know the weird side of things. I, I mean, I, I have worked online for many years and I've always said to everyone that ev the beauty with online is that everything can be tracked. Yeah. Now, there, there's obviously, there are negative sides of things and that all depends on the people. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, it's, a, it's certainly a strange new world um, with regards to the privacy and security on online. Yeah. Um, and... Because you're trusting essentially the companies that are doing this to be doing it right, and sure, there there, there are not to be any holes or massive but gaps in those. You're also oh, trusting them privacy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And but you're also trusting them for many years forwards, right? Because they're they're, they're collecting that data now, and sure, they might not be using it now. Um, but then someone might take over the company in X number of years' time, and still have access to all of that data, and then decide to do whatever it is they want to do with it then. Yeah, but the only real way around all of that is to not be online um, yes, and true. not use computers. Yeah. Um, which in the, the modern day, I just don't think is really that possible. Um, I mean, it totally is like there's, uh, I mean, I'm moving off to the mountains in two weeks time to the middle of nowhere to like escape things. So, uh, so who knows? But you're going to still be completely embedded in the online world. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. So, yeah, I'm exactly. still staying online. Yeah, I yeah, mean, I'm exactly. just, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but That'll we'll be tricky. That you, can, you can fax some code over to the guys in London. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly that. <laughs> it's like Mozart, right? You can, you can, you can code without actually seeing any, anything that's happening. You just know what's going to happen at the end of it. <laughs> so there's a, there is a, there's a uh, well, uh, well respected is possibly the wrong word. There's a guy called Richard Stallman in the, uh, coding community right. who's who's been around for many many years he was kind of the front the one of the first guys across the open source movement i'm i'm probably 
not giving him enough credit for some stuff. But uh, he he has everything offline, uh, and he codes and then pushes it online and then goes back offline <laughs> and kind of grabs everything that he wants from online to then save it offline so that he can view it when he wants it. Yeah, um, It's a really weird way to live. It is kind of weird. Uh, I mean, I've become quite accustomed now to saving everything to Evernote. So on that sense, anything that I Love come across, Evernote. I like. Yeah, I, I, I clip everything, essentially, because I, I don't like the idea of links disappearing or stuff going offline. So uh, I've got quite a big bundle of stuff there, but I, I, you know, I can't imagine doing that. And, and uh, you know, you were talking about the fact that, you, you know, it's difficult to know what Shazam is going to do with it. And... I was wondering, like, if because it doesn't seem to be any money in the rec- in the recommendation side of things from from the last FM perspective. That's that's the one thing that I'm wondering why they're doing it because uh, does that make money from from uh, affiliates? I mean, well, they, like, make, they make some money from affiliate, but their big thing that they've been pushing, like, and, and that's actually part of the, ne- the next story, is the, the fact that it's all advertising related. You know, their big box and the big valuation comes from the fact that they are able to uh, target. TV viewers on their second screen experience uh, and, uh, uh, you know, help advertisers, advertisers tag, tag them in a better way. And so uh, it just kind of feels like the data part of it and even the, the affiliate part of it to an extent is not really a core uh, focus for the company anymore, but I might be completely wrong on that. So uh, I, I just wanted to uh, mention the fact that they've launched a new advertising related product called Resonate. So this uh, is aimed at helping TV uh, networks uh, better monetize viewers on their second screens while they're watching TV. So it was tested uh, during the Billboard Music Awards uh, with the Dick Clark Productions and the Chevrolet. And, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't really go, the, the articles that I found on this don't really go too much into details as to what it actually does. But essentially it uh, it seems to be able to deliver more targeted messaging to uh, consumers that are shazamming stuff on the second screen that is related to uh, the brand advertisers that are doing work with uh, uh, both of the event and the Shazam at the same time. So uh, the company is now partnered with networks like AMC, A plus C and Fuse uh, to use a new service and uh, uh, they found uh, through Nielsen that viewers had a 10% higher ad and brand recall for ads with Shazam than uh, those from the same brands without an interactive component. So uh, interesting stuff there. I just wonder how that's going to play out uh, but uh, you know advertising is just a fascinating world so <laughs> so when I, you say ads with Shazam does that mean that these are ads these are I don't know advertising companies that have pre-arranged with Shazam to produce some additional content yeah. assuming that viewers have Shazam open and are while Shazam-ing, they're watching yeah. the ad good lord quite yeah. a lot of ads nowadays have got in the bottom left hand corner a little Shazam logo yeah. See, I just don't watch TV with ads. I just, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm in the dark. I should try it. It sounds kind of, kind of fun for like the first time. Yeah, I mean that's that's like, I guess the key reason. I mean, it's it's one wonders how short-lived or long-lived this trend is going to be. I mean, uh, there's, there's still mm-hmm. the trend of event, you know, events that are happening on real TV, like the Sharknado two thing that happened uh, this week. It drew almost four million viewers in the US, which were all watching in real time. And of course, they were uh, watching the adverts that were coming with the uh, sci-fi, uh, uh, you know, uh, broadcast that was happening. And uh, so in that sense, I guess that's really powerful because you can have adverts that are augmented and then people are watching them at the same time. They're talking about it online. They're doing all sorts of stuff with it. And so if you can mm-hmm. offer them an augmented experience, that's great. Uh, but it's just a question of how for how long networks are going to continue pushing for these kind of events type situations or how much on demand is going to take over really sorry just quickly how many people watch sharknado 2 did you just say 3.9 million in the stop the planet i'm getting off that's just the us right yeah at the same time as far as i understand stay classy (laughs) it is quite fun uh, I love a disaster movie, so it's, it's <laughs> of any kind. It's fine. Um, yeah. Also, with their ad stuff, that does uh, scare me a little bit even more, I think, from the fact that if I've got something running on my computer that's constantly listening to what's going on around me, uh, what I'm chatting about uh, with friends, and suddenly what could happen is I'm there going, oh, I really fancy a drink. And then suddenly up pops on my screen. Oh, why don't you buy Coca Cola? Yeah, yeah, um, that, that could be that could uh, happen. And not only I, I mean, I think that will happen in the not too distant future. I mean, I think we all that there's much more money in advertising than many other uh, industries. Yeah. At the same time, the what they're all trying to do is use innovative technology. Yeah. I mean, we're kind of seeing that with a lot of our day to day stuff. Is people, we're coming up with. Um, things that we strongly believe will actually work 
with regards to getting numbers and sales, but because it's not innovative, um, they don't want to go with it. Right. Uh, or then we might come up with something that's massively innovative, but not really that good from with regards to actual uh, trying to achieve what it's trying to achieve, and that's the one they'll go with. Um, so uh, it's it's. It's a funny time and space. Yes, absolutely. And uh, uh, I want to talk about a couple of startups that got acquired uh, this week. And uh, uh, by Rhapsody, of all companies, it's an interesting little spree that Rhapsody went on as they announced the acquisition of uh, uh, a formerly uh, defunct uh, uh, company, XFM, which uh, sh- shuttered uh, at the end of May after a few months of, uh, of uh, uh, troubles. And they also uh, announced the acquisition of uh, Sound Tracking. Uh, so uh, Sound Tracking by acquiring the parent company, uh, Schematic collab so uh, let's talk about xfm first uh, so i got an email from uh, the company ceo and founder uh, dan Cantor that said they were working with uh, shazam now and that the company would essentially relaunch at some point with a mobile offering uh, apps uh, and uh, uh, of course uh, the 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 uh, wealth of shazam uh, of uh, rhapsody's uh, catalog uh, to go behind it uh, xfm was essentially a playlisting and recommendation uh, uh, app so it uh, web service not app uh, but it, it kind of feels like it made sense for Rhapsody to buy it just because it was probably like a very cheap acquisition to make they got all the database of playlists I would imagine with that and their technology and they can probably do something with that uh, as part of the product and uh, let's not forget that Rhapsody also has Napster here in Europe and uh, and in South America so uh, on XFM anything to to comment uh, I guess you know uh, from a a developer's point of view said you have, you may have heard more about it because it had all those issues about exporting playlists and stuff uh, from December onwards but uh, I, I don't know anything on on, on XFM oh, really no no okay <laughs> um, so I used XFM every now and then briefly yeah never I mean more as a just to test just yeah. to see what it was like um, there's quite a lot of I mean there's I say there's quite a lot that's an understatement uh, nowadays, there are thousands of services that are uh, cropping up all over the place because someone has spent a weekend and made something yeah. and then uh, has launched it to the big wide world. Um, and it's I, the same with all of these music services is how what's how what's how are they going to make any money from it? Now, don't get me wrong. I am I, I, I'm one of the the worst people at trying to figure out how to make money from stuff. Yeah. But at the same time, if you want to do something and you just want to focus on that for X number of months, let alone years, there's got to be some money coming in. Yeah. Um, and I strongly believe you can live off hardly anything if you're in the right situation. But at the same time, you still need something. Um, and there's so many of these services that I just can't see how, I mean, how they're going to make any money from it. I mean, with... We, with I mean, Tomahawk. with this, I guess, because they are embedding it into a bigger company, it makes sense because it becomes, uh, I guess, a, a feature. So that's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I mean, yeah. and, and with regards to like the acquisition, we don't know what the deal was. Yeah. Like, it, 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 it was, it was closed down a while ago. Yeah. Um, and as you said, they probably got some data that could be useful, whether it is just playlists or stuff. Um, which, if I had shut down a company and then someone came to me and said, "Hey," can we have your playlist data and we'll give you X amount of money and I've already shut down the company, I'll be like, well, yeah, that's making something out of nothing. Yeah. Um, and they might give so, jobs to the people that were working there anyway. So in, in Sure, case, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, it um, sounds like a good, uh, a good win for them. It's a, it's a great win, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Jesse, I wanted to ask you about uh, what your thoughts about uh, Soundtracking are. So that Soundtrack, Soundtracking is the other company that was acquired by XFM, and that's a company that was still uh, live and uh, and uh, working, uh, you know, uh, working hard to improve its service. Uh, it provides a sort of Instagram-like experience for music fans, where you can tag a picture to music and uh, use that as as sort of something you can share online as a sort of soundtrack to what you're doing at any given time. Do, do, do you feel like this is another c- cool feature that could uh, be a part of Rhapsody and Napster in the in the coming? future i guess that's what they have planned for it um yeah. I'm, it's not one that i'm super familiar with and it, i think i remember checking it out um but you know discarding it like so many other um interesting and exciting music startups that yeah that you see now and then um so yeah i think it could be a great feature it kind of sets them apart a little bit from from other comparable services which yeah. is always a good thing to have some unique selling points if it's something that you know has an existing audience and that brings the audience to Rhapsody, then that's going to be a good thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it feels like they they concentrated on getting a couple of companies that 
may have been a much lower price tag on some of the bigger acquisitions that we've seen and uh, lately like uh, uh, songs out with Google for example uh, and, but they can still provide them with some sort of added functionality that can be useful to consumers at, at the end of the day so uh, I guess it's not the headline acquisitions that are going to get consumers to join Rhapsody but if they can mm. find those features useful enough to stick with the company that's that's the main thing because uh, I think churn is one of the bigger concerns of streaming services still to this day uh, people are switching yeah. quite, quite a lot I, uh, I hear about that you know like I I pretty much stick with one because yeah. I can't tedious as it sounds I just can't be bothered going through the learning curve and figuring out how another one works so I'm I'm kind of envious of people who do cheer. I'm like, well, that's uh, you know, it's good. Try different stuff. Yeah. Tell me but about then, it. Jesse, I presume you, I imagine that you're using one of the bigger streaming services. I am. So, wow. Well, so I, I I also use one of the bigger streaming services, um, and I think the people that are churning about all of the smaller ones are because they they they're not paying very much, if anything. Right. And they have no real emotional tie, no no connection from a time spent. They haven't already created all of their playlists, uh, etc. And they're just trying stuff out. And until they finally stop with one of the bigger streaming services, they will continue mm. churning. I mean, it, it's. I also yeah. There's so many of these small little music uh, like so soundtracking sounds to me like one of the the new wave of. I want to share a song with a friend. How do I do it? Yeah. Because um, I have no other way to send a song to a friend to tell them to listen to it. Um, How would you do that? I have no idea. Not a clue. I think at the moment I would have to attach uh, a, a vinyl to a pigeon and get them to fly to my friend. That's, yeah. how, I, that's how I've done it in the past, yeah. Right, yeah, exactly. That. The problem with that is that that takes quite a while. So, it, and it's a bit of a breakage rate as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They don't always get there. <laughs> um, there is some packet failure. So it's kind of, yeah, I, ugh, so many, so many. So at least now there's one less. Sound <laughs> one less. So Do you know what, though? Other... I think that w when it comes to things like, well, XFM and the discovery service acquisition and, and curation being the catchphrase of the day when it comes to streaming services, I think that, that's, I mean, it still remains the most important thing that, um, as far as I know, isn't really right yet. As streaming services just seem to get closer and closer to emulating terrestrial radio, um, but on a more personal level, curation has to be it. But, yeah, I mean, it's not happened for me yet. How about you guys? I uh, used, uh, I don't know if you know DI.FM, uh, Digitally Imported. No. It's an online radio service. It's been around for years. Um, okay. And it's it's... They, it's very much electronic music, but they've got like 50 channels across all of the different subgenres, genres that you'll have never heard of. Um, of amongst, uh, I haven't heard of most of them. Um, they and, got uh, cool names. I they love got genre cool names. names. Yeah, yeah, cool exactly. Genre that. Names. <laughs> and they're all, it, it's all electronic music. But um, I will, every now and then, I'll just listen to that for a day. Um, and that's a totally human curated, it's a radio station. Yeah. Uh, it is a terrestrial radio yeah. um, and it has ads um, because I don't pay for the premium version um, and I discover I still discover music through it um, and actually that's where the Shazam is helping me because I have it on in the background yeah. and it's a website, I just go to a website and I press play and then I minimise it um, and now I can see what the songs are and I can go back and I go oh that was that song was Yep. I mean, I, when uh, Pandora was available in the UK many years ago, um, and I was using it then, I think I actually bought most of my albums um, across that six-month period from listening to Pandora and finding new songs. Yeah. Um, now, I have to admit, I haven't really bought many albums recently um, for many reasons. Uh, uh, but it's... Definitely, yeah, there's still the human element is needed. That's why Beats, right? That, that's what supposedly was Beats' um, winning thing. Yeah. Now, until it's out in the UK, I've got no idea. Yeah. No, the it's... human element, but also editorial, which is obviously a human element, but, you know, interviews and, I don't know, features, if that's what you're into. But... Yeah. I mean, it just feels like radio. It's, it's difficult mm. for any service to provide the wealth of content that, people need today because 
even if I go onto a curated uh, platform of any kind from any streaming service, if I go to them two two days in a row and I find the same content, I get frustrated, which is completely irrational because I, I, I should expect the fact that you know a service can't churn things out on a daily basis, but it kind of feels like that's what people are looking for today. And so I wonder how many services are able to do that with a human curator and actually turn things around quickly enough for people to not get bored with what they're putting out. Why do you look, go back to radio there? And I mean, the radio. Yeah, you can playlist. look at a radio or other playlists that are suggested, and it feels like, you know, it takes, you know, maybe two weeks for things to shift around. And, and that's way too long, in a sense. Yeah, no, right. actually, it's a good point you made. I mean, I listen to BBC Six Music a lot. And um, recently I had it on like 24 7 for, for a week or two, just happened to be constantly listening to the radio. And, and I did actually get quite over lowering the playlist inside out. So. Yeah, I was going to say, but radio, Andrea, but now I'm like, actually, but radio also has drawbacks, so. Yeah, no, exactly, absolutely. Uh, we all I need mean, radio, variation. It's, it's totally, again, it's like the rest of the music world. It's got a lot less money than it used to. I mean, there's, uh, I, I used to work at um, a local radio station in South Wales many years ago, and I remember there we had, there must have been about 50 people that worked at the radio station, and I went back there last summer just to catch up with a friend, and there was about 12. Yeah. Um, and it was massively sad because it was a huge station at the time. It was um, a lot of people to start with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was a lot of people on ad sales. There was, yeah, uh, it was sure. a big station. Um, I'm not going to name names, but um, it was a big station. And, uh, and they've got no one there. No one at all, really. Um, and it's, I read an article actually yesterday that was last, for the last few years, at a lot of TV uh, conferences, people have been berating the TV uh, world for saying they're where music used to be five years ago. Um, and they were saying that as a bad thing to the TV world for not opening up. Um, and you look at all of the, the money they're making. Like, yeah, they are exactly where music was five years ago. But five years ago, even in music, there was some money. Yeah. Um, like it, it's, I don't understand how people were giving it as a negative thing um, for the last couple of years that TV was where music was five years ago. I'm seeing more and more that there's that's a, that's a weird less. statement to make, right? Because it feels like TV is in a very different place. To, maybe TV is where, where the music industry was 15 years ago, but not five. Well, this was a few years ago that they were saying. Oh, okay, right, cool. <laughs> so I was like, I mean, this was five years ago, it was still pretty terrible. Actually. Come on, guys, do the math. Yeah, it was worse than today, <laughs> five years ago. Yeah, yeah. It was just, still just depressing. <laughs> that's, what, that's when I started the podcast, right? It was just like, you know, people crying. <laughs> we, had, we had no services, there was nothing there. It's like, you know, it's a disaster, a disaster. Uh, <laughs> Jesse Saturday going, oh, Jesus. Uh, Jesus. Uh, yeah, uh, Carry on. Uh, a couple of quick uh, service announcements. First of all, people should go and check out Panel Picker at South by Southwest. Uh, so it's panelpicker.sxsw.com, I think, or something along those lines. I haven't entered anything this year. I didn't have time, unfortunately. I had a few deadlines that I was running up against. I have a the... recommendation. Oh, actually. cool, great. There's one called Mobile Music Nerdgasm. Nice. Vote for that one. Perfect. Please. And yeah, so I don't have any recommendations as of yet, but I'm sure you'll find some great panels to check out at South by Southwest 2014. And uh, did I have another service announcement? Uh, if I did, I totally forgot about it. Uh, and oh yeah, just a quick a quick burn uh, that uh, YouTube sustained another casualty this week. Uh, not not a real casualty, but a, a personnel casualty as its head of product management, uh, Shiva uh, Ram, Rajam Jarajarman, uh, has left to take up a new role at Spotify. So uh, he led the development of the site's consumer features for more than four years including it's yet to launch music subscription service and as of yet it's still unclear as to whether these departures indicate that uh, youtube music is uh, in, in in turmoil or whether it's actually uh, a good thing because uh, some new order is being established but i guess we'll it, we can only we'll all be able to tell if and when the service launches in a few months time and uh, uh, i wanted to finish by talking about a story uh, on podcasts and uh, radio actually as we were talking about that just a second ago so uh, this is a story that came out last week and uh, 
uh, essentially Apple uh, has acquired a, a radio app called Swell. Um, Record reported that the price tag on the company was about $30 million, just a 1% of what Apple paid for Beats Music earlier this year. And uh, it would make for an interesting purchase uh, given that uh, the po- um, Apple's own podcast app is plagued with, by problems and has only got one or one and a half uh, average uh, uh, review rating on, on the store, which is pretty terrible for, for Apple's own app. And, uh, uh, you know, Swell essentially is a an app that uh, curated different uh, uh, audio content. It was a mostly talk content uh, into uh, segments uh, and uh, allowed people to create essentially their own uh, programming to be able to listen to different uh, uh, podcasts or uh, radio programming that they, they wanted to um, uh, to uh, listen on a daily basis uh, to essentially. Uh, that's the sort of, that's the reason why I find it exciting because I haven't seen anybody really try to integrate radio with uh, uh, on-demand streaming in a meaningful way or, you know, audio content with on, uh, with online streaming, you know, in a meaningful way. Uh, iHeartRadio has tried it. Uh, they have, they've got, like, a, a personalized station where you can choose a few bits of the uh, sort of uh, iHeartRadio talk content and then you can choose a few of your favorite artists and then it creates sort of, like, a mash between Pandora and, like, a, a talk content, which is really cool. But I would love to see if Apple could attempt to do something along those lines as well, given that it has so many podcasts and he hasn't really done anything with them, which is a real shame. So, I don't know. Uh, Sid, do you, do you think that there is something there in terms of being able to bring together sort of a, a, a smarter way to organize uh automatic playlisting that does incorporate uh, podcasting in, in, into the picture. You know, I'd love to, for somebody to be able to go to a service that can uh, stream 10 minutes of, of this show and then stream, you know, two tracks and then do another 10 minutes of this show and sort of play like that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's going to have to be automated. Yeah. I'm not going to want to sit there and choose five podcasts and then 10 tracks. Yeah. And then with regards to splitting, like your example you used of splitting up this into sections... I mean, you're going to have to start doing that if, like, they're, they're not going to be able to magically work out where our topic changes are. Yeah. Um, so I think if, if people were to... I, yes, I think if it were to become automatic and it's just a case of me flicking a switch and saying, turn radio on, um, and it does have the, the, the features uh, from the podcasts, etc., with then the music that is recommended to me and stuff that i should listen to and then occasionally stuff that they know that i like yeah um then yeah that can that i think that could work um it would be interesting to see what algorithms they use to do that yeah um because working well i think actually to be fair i think it's definitely possible um yeah i like it as an idea (laughs) cool excellent in two weeks time watch out for (laughs) i think it sounds amazing yeah. Have you, have you what do you mean in it? two weeks' time? Sorry? You're going to produce it, Sid, right? Yeah. Wait, probably what? The only person that's, that's, what just, was, that's what I was saying. Watch out in two weeks' time say, for... Uh, <laughs> Sid just made a statement that sounded as though he actually knew what an algorithm looked like. And no one knows what an algorithm looks like. <laughs> Come on. Jesse, Come on. Jesse, like I'm a, a thing that is over there. <laughs> I use algorithms all the time. They're all very different. Oh, no, 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 you're mistaken. <laughs> no, you're mistaken. <laughs> no such um, thing as an algorithm. There's no such thing. That's excellent. Uh, it is literally, we just have little mice in cages <laughs> that just determine which one goes on which. It's kind of like that octopus that was betting on the football. Now um, I understand. Now I understand. I love it. Yeah. I, I love they just it. press right buttons depending <laughs> on, like, that works out what music is going to be played next. That's why it's a hit and miss. Yeah. sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't it's a sonic mystery yeah mm. and the other the other app that i really want somebody to build is an app that would allow me to listen to podcasts but also listen to music at the same time <gasps> and that's really that's really a lot, something i'd love what like if, if I could listen. crazy multitasking well no like if you listen to an audiobook i listen to quite a few audiobooks on audible i would love to all have... right so so here we go so andrea oh. so yeah. you listen to your audiobooks on audible yeah and then where do you listen to your music on spotify that's all on my right, phone so i have got this groundbreaking idea for you right what you could do is you can have audible open and then you could have spotify open and then you could press play <laughs> on both of them at the same no, time no it stops the, the audio engine on, on the uh, on ios stops one audio feed from oh, the, on iOS. the other yeah, yeah on ios yeah that's right yeah, yeah. so you can't run them both at the same time uh that's that's Heck the... it run an algorithm <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> but I was wondering if it's possible. Uh, you know, I, I guess there's probably some some like pickets that uh, both companies have put in place to avoid people ripping content off uh, their platforms into different things. But there is like a very very extensive audio API on iOS now. It's even more extensive after the latest release. So I wonder if you have the right sort of authorization keys and you are sort of a respected provider of these kind of apps, whether you would be allowed to access both streams to create. So yeah, like, you totally can. I mean, as long as you basically, there's this thing called Audio Bus. Yeah. Um, and so that's how a lot of DJ mixing apps now work. Um, so they're taking audio in from the separate apps. The problem with Audio Bus, though, is that you can route the signal from any place to any place. And so I think it would never get the OK of, of the likes of Audible or Spotify to actually route its signal because it's just too open. There would have right. to be like a specific app that only does that between those two or three different apps and, and can allow you to do it in a very closed environment. And then you've got the whole licensing issue. Y yeah. I don't that. But no, but if you're a premium Spotify subscriber and you pay for your ebooks, really, there's... No? No, because you can route it to a recorder. Yeah, you could. Well, no, no, no. I mean, I mean uh, if, if you're not allowed to do that, if it's just a service that tells you, you know, it's an app that you open up and you say, you know, link it to Spotify here and link it to Audible here, you log into both services and then you can access your files or, you know, the, the streams from both services. Uh, of course, you know, it would never work in an open environment, but I don't know. How about, how about you just have Audible running and turn the radio on? Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Well played, Jesse. Yeah. <laughs> just an idea. I'm just, I'm just, I just like multitasking, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like. <laughs> How can you do that? How can you listen to an audio book and listen to music at the same time? What about when the lyrics come on? Yeah, but that's background, right? No. Don't the audio books have like like you can have a conversation with happening? somebody whilst still listening to music? Audio books should have soundtracks. I mean, what's that about? Yeah, exactly. I mean, they have like little horrid motifs at the beginning and ends of I they do. sections, but they're, yeah, they're just not very good. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll end my rant there. And uh, once <laughs> again, I think we can draw the show to close, but not before I plug your site so once again. And that is uh, we make awesome dot it for Sid and also power to the people dot FM to check out uh, the latest project of the company. And it's uh, wixedworks.com for Jesse. And you can follow them on Twitter. The handles are on the uh, um, uh, video, but I'm going to read them now because, uh, uh, of course, audio listeners are not going to have access to that. And it's uh, Sid Lawrence at Sid Lawrence <laughs> for Sid and it's at Wixedworks for uh, Jesse. So thank you so much both for uh, joining me today. Thank you. It was fun. Thanks for having us. Uh, and you can find the uh, Digital Music Trends uh, every week uh, on digitalmusictrends.com. Also, check out uh, the uh, links through to the one to one show where I interview interesting uh, companies and uh, startups that are working in the digital music space. And uh, follow the show on uh, Twitter on at Digital Music Trends. Uh, have a fantastic week and uh, till next time. <laughs> <laughs>